Hello there. Thanks for joining us. Um, today we're going to be looking at the Shroud of Turin. That's a controversial thing, but I believe it scientifically proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'd like you to concentrate on the screen because this is really, really interesting stuff. I believe that Jesus Christ left behind him absolute and undeni undeniable scientific evidence of his resurrection. Um, in fact, I, believe, I think it would have been easier for a fraudulent medieval artist such as Leonardo da Vinci to have designed and launched the Hubble Space Telescope than to have created the Shroud of Turin. Um, the technology to create the Hubble Space Telescope in the year 2009 is available, but the, te the laser technology technology to create the three-dimensionally encoded photonegative image on the shroud of Turin doesn't exist today. Um, all information and images are intended to be used under the fair use clause of the copyright law. Now there is abundant historical evidence that Jesus actually rose from the dead. He's a, uh, Jesus is a person in history uh, and Jesus himself prophesied his own, his own resurrection in Mark chapter 10. It says, he said, they will mock him, that's the Son of God himself, and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Now Flavius Josephus was born in 37 AD and was a Jewish Pharisee, and this is what he wrote. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. Pilate condemned him to the cross and he appeared to them alive on the third day. So there we have a Jewish historian who said that Jesus Christ died on the cross, a figure in history who died on the cross, and also came back alive on the third day. Now the Shroud of Turin is authentic and scientifically proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be trying to uh, impress upon you the accuracy of this statement over the next 57 minutes. So what really happened after the crucifixion? Well, the crucifixion happened at Golgotha, the place of the skull just by the Damascus Gate, and Jesus was nailed with three, three nails uh, to the cross. We have a separate teaching just on the crucifixion. Um, and after he died, the first thing they did was place a, a napkin over his face. Now, if somebody died on a road near you, somebody would cover the person's face, and that's exactly what they did with Jesus, with a, a thing which in Greek is called a sudarian and then covered his body with um, a sheet called a sindon. And Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and covered in, the in that shroud there, just like that. We're looking at that much more carefully in a while. Uh, his body was placed in the garden tomb, which was owned by Joseph of Arimathea, and the great stone was rolled across the entrance of a tomb, and the Roman soldiers sealed and guarded the tomb and used an iron spike to do that. And let me tell you that iron spike is still there. It's been analyzed and shown to be a Roman spike dating from the time of Christ. Uh, Jesus, of course, his spirit went to paradise with a repentant thief. But the dead body of Jesus uh, was, was left behind in the garden tomb um, for three days and for three nights. It says in Psalm 16, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So Jesus' body didn't corrupt in any way during those three days and three nights. Now I believe at the resurrection, the Holy Spirit re-entered the dead body of Jesus with a tremendous burst of light with the emission of nuclear radiation. That's a big comment to uh, say, uh, to state, but uh, we've got some scientific evidence later on to back that up. Now the physics of the resurrection, I believe, were similar to the physics of the transfiguration. And in both cases, the atoms of Jesus' body accelerated to the speed of light, and Jesus actually entered eternity. And the radiation emitted at the resurrection scorched a photonegative image of the scourged, Jesus, uh, scourged and crucified Jesus onto the first century linen cloth with three-dimensional encoding. Now, at the carbon dating, which I'll be talking about, they found excessive carbon-14 on the shroud. And I believe this was caused by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So after three days, Jesus came back to life, and the, both the disciples and the women, they entered the garden tomb, and they saw two separate um, pieces of cloth. First of all, the napkin placed around Jesus' head, that was placed to one side and folded, and a large piece of linen, which described it with two Greek words, which we'll be looking at, a syndon and an athonia. Um, and that's happened at the garden tomb, which is now empty. There's no body there because Jesus came back to life. That's on the door of the garden tomb. He is not here, for he is risen. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Now, there are lots and lots of people we need to give credit to. 
Um, the official photographer for the Shroud of Turin research project was Barry Schwartz, who set up a fantastic website called Shroud.com. And he and Ian Wilson, who's a historian, have co-authored co uh, co a magnificent book, The Turin Shroud. And there are lots of other experts, I'll be n naming, naming them, but there are photographic experts, nuclear physicists, botanists, archaeologists, historians, forensic pathologists, radiologists, carbon dating experts, textile specialists, and experts in ancient Jewish antiquities. I won't go through all the list of names because we will be naming them. Now, first of all, people say the Shroud of Turin is not in the Bible. Well, it is, but you just have to read the Greek words. Uh, you do need to have a look at the Greek words very carefully, and that's what we're going to do now. Now, in a normal Jewish wedding, uh, sorry, a normal Jewish burial, sorry about that, a normal Jewish burial, uh, there were two pieces of cloth. First of all, this sudarian around the face and the kairas, or uh, bandages, uh, sp specifically bandages for, wi for winding around a dead body used to wind around the body. So, in a normal Jewish burial, the body was wrapped first in the napkin, described as the sudarian, and the linen burial windings, described as kairas. So, for example, Lazarus was raised, by the dead, ra raised, from, the, raised from the dead by Jesus, and it says in the scriptures that he had this sudarian around his head and the kairas around his body. That's in John chapter 11. It says the dead man came out, that's Lazarus, with, with his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen, uh, kairas, and a cloth, the Greek word is sudarian, around his face. Now we know what that word sudarian uh, actually is because it's used elsewhere in the New Testament. It was actually a towel for wiping the perspiration from the face or for binding the face of a corpse. Now in Acts 19, it says God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs, the, the word sudarian in Greek, and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick. So we know what that word means. Now, at the burial of Jesus, uh, two, um, two items, uh, two, two pieces of cloth were used. First of all, I mentioned before, the sudarin uh, around the face of Jesus and the sindon around his body. So there we have that word sindon. And it's also described um, later on in the book of John as athonia. So, let's look at those two words, Sindon and Athonia. Well, in Mark 15, it says that he, that's Joseph of Arimathea, bought fine linen. Now, the Greek word is Sindon, and took him down and wrapped him in linen. So, let's look at that word Sindon. Well, we know what the word Sindon means, because like, like the other word, it's used elsewhere in the New Testament. It says at the end of the book of Mark, Mark 14, now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth, that's Greek syndon, thrown around his naked body. So it was a large piece of cloth, large enough to, for, for Mark, most people think it's Mark, uh, it actually covered his entire body. So Jesus was actually buried in two separate pieces of cloth, the sudarian around his, uh, his head and a large piece of linen described separately as a syndon and athonia around his body. Now we'll look at that word athonia. It's in John chapter 20. It says, Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw linen cloths. And on this occasion, the word used is athonia there with a sidarian around his head. Well, we know what that word athonia is because like the other words, it's used elsewhere in the New Testament. The word is the derivative of the Greek word athone, which means a linen cloth, and especially a sail. In the same word used in the following scripture, it's in Acts chapter 10. You remember that uh, Peter had a vision, and he saw a great sheet coming down from heaven, knit at the four corners. And remember, the great sheet had lots of animals in it. Well, the word used is athonia. So we know that the, 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 the word used to describe the shroud of Turin is like a great sheet. So, now the sudarian around the head of Jesus, actually now in Spain, is called the sudarium of Oviedo in Spain. And the sindon or athonia around the body of Jesus is what we now call the Shroud of Turin. Now, on the Sunday morning, the women were going to come and do the normal Jewish uh, burial, but that took many hours involved in the application of a lot of ointment and spices. Well, they simply didn't have, um, they didn't do it because Jesus wasn't there. He'd come back to life again. 
Now we're going to look at the historical authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. Some people think it's a medieval fraud. Well, that's certainly not uh, what other people think. The Shroud of Turin is a piece of ancient precious linen, 14 foot 3 inches long and 3 foot 7 inches wide, and contains the photo-negative image of a man who has been severely beaten and crucified. Now, this is a, a textile expert called, um, called Mef Mechtild Fleury Lemberg, and she says that textiles from Masada in Israel are identical to the Shroud of Turin. She's a world-famous authority on historic textiles. She's the former curator of Switzerland Abegg Foundation Textile Museum. And this is what she says. The shroud has a distinctive, exceptionally fine quality Z-twist, a three-over-one herringbone pattern, and a very distinctive joining seam. She says, actually, the shroud of Turin is a very precious piece of ancient linen. And the shroud very closely resembles unique ancient textiles found in tombs of the Jewish fortress Masada in Israel. Uh, she says that the Shroud of Turin was professionally woven by hand in the Middle East on an ancient Egyptian or Syrian loom. Now, um, in 1192, was published what's called the Hungarian Prey Codex Manuscript. Um, it's, uh, it's been studied an enormous amount, and it does actually display um, a, a picture of the Shroud of Turin. It's got the same uh, herringbone weave and the very famous so-called poker burn holes on the shroud. Um, so there we have evidence that the shroud of trim was certainly around in 1192. Now this is important, and you'll see why later on. Uh, Mechtil Fleury Lemberg specifically discounts what's called the invisible mending theory. There's been a recent theory that some additional material added to the shroud. She says that in her professional opinion, no additional cloth has been added to the shroud at any time. Uh, there is a very excellent um, DVD called The Fabric of Time, in which she and many other experts, in, uh, experts are interviewed. Now, Dame Isabel Pixek is an internationally acclaimed artist, and she's winner of the Grand Award for Mural Paintings. Now, she says that in her professional opinion, the Shroud of Turin is not a painting. There's lack of emulsion, lack of light focus, lack of directionality, lack of outline, lack of foreshortening, lack of perspective, and lack of distortion. All very technical stuff. But remember, this is a, a very professional, um, a professionally acclaimed, uh, world-acclaimed artist. And she says the Shroud of Turin is not a painting of any description. The Shroud of Turin is actually a mixed photo-negative and photo-positive image. Um, the Shroud was first photographed by Secunda Pia in Italy in 1898. Um, now here we have um, two images. On the left we have a negative image of Robert Louis Stevenson. On the right, a normal uh, image of Robert Louis Stevenson, what's called photo-positive. So on the left, photo-negative. On the right, photo-positive. Well, the Shroud of Turin is the same. On the left there, we have a photo-negative image, and that's what you're looking at when you look at the Shroud of Turin. When Secunda Pia took a photograph in 1898, his negative was actually a photo-positive of the negative on the left. So his negative was actually a photo-positive, but not completely, because you can see coming from the crown of thorns the blood, but because this was real blood on the shroud, uh, this was now in photo-negative. So there is, uh, on the left, we have um, um, a highlighted picture of the face on the shroud with the actual blood on there, that's real blood, type AB, with lots of bilirubin in it, which is what um, crucified uh, victims had in it because of the torture involved, and on the right, a photo negative. Uh, sorry, the, the one on the left is a photo negative, and the one on the right is a photo positive of the negative. But you can see that the blood is now white in color instead of red on the left because that is photo negative. Here we have the whole of the uh, on the left hand side, the actual shroud, as you can see from the front, and on the right, you can actually see the image of Jesus Christ on the right. There's the back of the shroud on the left, and when you take a, pic uh, a, a, a picture of it, your negative will be a photo positive showing the back of Jesus with the scourge marks. Um, now, just by way of, just by introducing the possibility of a medieval forger, 
Some people think it's Leonardo da Vinci. Now, why could, and why, how could Leonardo da Vinci or anybody else for that matter, and why would they produce a mixed photo negative and photo positive image in the Middle Ages? Now, why, how could they, and why would they? And why would they today, for example? Now we're going to look at the Sidarium of Oviedo in Spain. Now it's been extensively researched by Dr. Alan Wanger, who's a professor emeritus of Duke University, and Mark Guskin, historian and author. And the blood on the Sidarium of Oviedo has the same blood group type AB as is found on the Shroud of Turin. Now this blood group AB is found in only 3% of the world's population. So Dr. Alan Wang employed his polarized image overlay technique to study correlations between the Shroud of Turin and the Sidarium of Oviedo in Spain. And he found 70 points of correlation on the front and of the Sidarium and 50 on the back. So we can make a, a conclusion here, a scientific conclusion, that the Sidarium of Oviedo in Spain and the Shroud of Turin were both used to cover the very same identical corpse because the blood group and the markings are identical. Now the importance of the Sidarium of Oviedo is its history, unlike the Shroud, the Sidarium of Oviedo, its history is very, is very well known. The Sidarium of Oviedo in Spain accompanied Philip and other Christians fleeing Palestine in 616 AD, and they traveled through Alexandria, Egypt, and into Spain at Cartagena. And the Shroud, uh, the Shroud, uh, Sorry, the Sidarium of Oviedo is now contained in an oak chest which was entrusted to Leandro, the Bishop of Seville. Now, there's a Spanish magistrate called Juan Moreno, and this is what he has to say on the subject. The scientific and medical studies of the Sidarium of Oviedo prove that it was the covering for the same man whose image is on the Shroud of Turin. We know that the Sidarium has been in Spain since the, 16, since the 1600s, how then can the radiocarbon dating claiming that the shroud is only from the 13th century be accurate? That's a very good question, and we're going to look at that and answer that question, hopefully. Now we're going to look at the um, Shroud of Turin from a forensic point of view. Uh, Dr. Robert Bucklin was a former forensic pathologist in Los Angeles, and he personally conducted over 25,000 autopsies. Opti op sorry, 25,000 autopsies. You can read about him on shroud.com. And he did some very de detailed an analysis, which I haven't got time to go through in detail, but he concluded as follows. The forensic pathologist will be aware that the individual whose image is depicted on the cloth has undergone puncture injuries to his wrist and feet, puncture injuries to his head, multiple traumatic whip-like injuries to his back, post-mortem puncture injuries to his chest area, which has released both blood and a water type of fluid. And from this data, it is not an unreasonable conclusion for the forensic pathologist to determine that only one person in history has undergone this sequence of events. That person is Jesus Christ. Now, on the shroud, there's pollen, which proves that the shroud of Turin was once in Jerusalem. Dr. Max Frey, was a member of Sterp, and he's a bot he was a botanist and Swiss criminologist. In other words, he solved crimes. He took samples from the surface of the shroud in 1973 and 1978, and he identified pollen spores and spores of many different plants that originate only in and around Jerusalem and areas of the Middle East that include the ancient cities of Constantinople and Edessa. There's been some subsequent research, uh, and the, these researchers include Dr. Danin, a botany professor at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Dr. Baruch, a pollen specialist at the Israel, Israel Antiquities Authority, Oswald Schurman, and Dr. Alan Wanger. And of the 28 plants found on the shroud, 27 bloom in the springtime, corresponding with the Jewish Passover. Cygophyllum dumosum, shown uh, grows only in Israel, Jordan, and the Sinai. And of the 28 plants, 20 are known to grow in Jerusalem itself, and eight others grow in the vicinity in the, Jude in the Jude Judean desert or the Dead Sea area. Though some of these plants may be found in Europe, 14 of the 28 plants only grow in the Middle East and never in Europe. Um, of the 28 plants, 27 bloom in springtime, corresponding with the Jewish Passover. And um, one plant is Zygophyllum dumosum, for which there is pollen as well as an image. And that grows only in Israel, Jordan, and the Sinai. And this is what Professor uh, Danin of the Hebrew University sums up. He says, 
This combination of flowers can be found in only one region of the world. The evidence clearly points to a floral grouping from the area surrounding Jerusalem. Conclusion, the Shroud of Turin was at one time in Jerusalem. Now there's also some dirt on the Shroud of Turin, it's called Travertine Arag Aragonite. Now when Jesus fell carrying that heavy crossbeam, um, he, he, he picked up some dirt from the streets of Jerusalem. And you can find that dirt called uh, Travertine Aragonite on the places on the Shroud of Turin corresponding to his nose and his left kneecap and also both heels. Uh, this uh, uh, Travertine Aragonite has been researched by Joseph Colbeck in America and Richard, Richard Levi Setti, also from America. And these two researchers compared dirt samples taken from the shroud and limestone from ancient Jerusalem tombs. And this is what Joseph Colbeck says. There may be other places in the world where identical Travertine Aragonite is found, however, no such places are known. Conclusion, the Shroud of Turin was at one time in Jerusalem. Now we're going to do some uh, detailed analysis, analysis of photos of the Shroud of Turin. First of all, the scourging. It says in the scriptures that Jesus was scourged. We cover that in our crucifixion uh, study. But I can think you can see very clearly there the scourging over the front and the back of Jesus. Jesus was scourged so that all the skin on his body was ripped off by over 120 different separate lashings. There's a crown of thorns placed over the head of Jesus. It comes from the lote bush, and you can see the blood tracking down from over 70 different um, places where the, 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 the thorns from the lote bush pierce Jesus' skull. Uh, pierce his, sorry, the, the, the skin over his skull. Um, there's fractured nasal cartilages which have been uh, discovered on the shroud. Those na nasal cartilages are broken, and that could have either happened during the mocking, and uh, the mocking um, when Jesus was beaten with rods, or it could have happened when he fell carrying that heavy crossbeam. Now, his hands were nailed, and you can see there that the hands were, the, we can work out there that the, the, first of all, that the nail went through the wrist, not through the palms, and we can work out that the position of the hands on the cross were, were the thumbs pointing down and the palms against the wood, with the blood tracking down in that position. So that picture there shows the actual correct position of Jesus on the cross. Uh, the actual nails went through what's called Death Dot's Point. We talk about this in our, uh, in our talk on the crucifixion. Uh, it's a very specific point, and that's where the, the um, nails went through, Death Dot's Point, which you can feel on the back of your own wrists. Now, in all medieval paintings, you always see the nails going through the palms of the wrists. That's not correct, because that wouldn't support the body of, of a man. The correct place is in Death Dot's Point in the wrist, and the place that uh, in the palm is simply not correct. Now on the shroud there's a, a, th a missing thumb. Um, this is simply caused by the weight of the body pulling, pulling down on those nails and causing the uh, hands to go into a claw-like position. So if you look carefully you can only see on the left there four fingers and no thumb. Four fingers and no thumb and that's how one of the reasons, one of many, we know reasons we know that the shroud is authentic. Now the nails uh, went into the feet. These nails were about 12 inches long and half an inch wide. Um, you can see clearly the blood uh, flowing from those uh, puncture wounds in the, in the feet, in the second inter, uh, intermetatarsal spaces. Um, the, the, uh, the right foot was placed against the upright, that's the stipes crucis. The left foot was placed on top and one nail was nailed through both feet in that position there. There's a spear wound. Uh, remember Jesus uh, was speared in his side. It actually, the the, the uh, spear actually between, went between his fifth and sixth right ribs. You can see that on the shroud. On the, on, the, on the top left picture there you can see some blood coming from the spear wound and you can also make out that blood has actually pu uh, sort of puddled underneath Jesus' back as he, uh, was, as he was laid in the garden tomb. Now, very importantly, the coins over the eyes date the shroud to, 29, to the years immediately after 29 AD. 
Over the eyes, you can make out, if you do some special, uh, special techniques, which Dr. Alan Wang has done, you can make out that coins were placed over the eyes. Um, to, it's basically, to keep the eyelids shut. And this research was done by Professor Alan Wanger. Uh, you can read about him on shroud.com. Uh, he's also written an excellent book called The Shroud of Turin. And this is his conclusion. According to Professor Wanger, the different coins over the right and left eye of the shroud were minted by Pontius Pilate in AD 29, which dates the shroud to the years after AD 29. Of course, the crucifixion was in AD 33. Now, I won't go into the exact details of exactly what he found over the right eye and the left eye, but he's quite certain that these are separate coins, both minted in AD 29 by Pontius Pilate. Now we come to some really fascinating stuff, that the three, this shroud has three-dimensional image properties. And this was discovered by NASA. In the center there, you can see Dr. John Jackson of NASA and his Shroud of Turin research project team. Now, the, uh, NASA, uh, the NASA computer, analyzing computer, was first produced to, uh, to analyze and pr produce three-dimensional images of the moon. What they did was send um, an orbiting satellite around the moon and take lots and lots of photographs of the moon and then feed all those separate photographs and images into the computer and the computer brought, uh, would produce a three-dimensional image of the moon. Well, uh, the Shroud of Turin has always been controversial, so somebody came up with the bright idea of, of putting the Shroud of Turin under the VP8 image analyzing computer that NASA used. There's Dr. 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 John Jackson, who's actually a former physics professor at the United States Air Force Academy. Um, and this fascinating experiment was performed in 1976 by Dr. John Jackson, Dr. Eric Jumper, uh, Doc, uh, Reverend Dr. Kenneth Stevenson, Charles Sh Charter, and Peter Schumacher. And they, they analyzed the Shroud of Turin with the VPA image analyzing computer. And as you can see on the bottom right there, produced a three-dimensional image of the face of Jesus Christ which actually makes it uh, unique on the whole planet. There is no other two-dimensional image on the planet that will do this because th this shroud is dimensionally encoded. You see, the shroud of, is actually a three-dimensional topographical image. The closer the cloth was to the body, the more the image was highlighted, and the image then acts like a photographic negative with light and dark reverse, but dimensionally encoded. It's this dimensional encoding which is so unique, which is why I'm absolutely certain that the Shroud of Turin was not a fraud, because nobody can do this, even today, in 2009. On the left there, you can see the three-dimensional body of Jesus on, uh, on the Shroud of Turin. Now, some people think that Leonardo da Vinci had a, a primitive camera called a camera occulta. Well, he may well have had that, but let me tell you that no camera today can produce these three-dimensional properties. Now we're going to look at carbon dating. Um, the whole theory of the, um, the, the, the Shroud of Turin is medieval is based on radioactive carbon dating. And you need to know a little bit about carbon dating. You don't have to know a lot, you do have to know a little. Um, now there are 111 elements that we know about, and one of them is carbon. It's in position 6, um, and there are three types of carbon. There's the normal C12, which is normal, normal carbon. Then there's two isotopes called C13 and C14. These are called isotopes. Now, radioactive C14 is actually formed high up in the stratosphere um, and then is incorporated into carbon dioxide, drifts down onto the surface of the Earth, and then is breathed in by uh, plants. Well, look at that. So um, radioactive C14 is formed in the upper atmosphere by the bombardment of nitrogen atoms with cosmic rays from the sun. We don't have to know the details of exactly how it all works, but let me just tell you very simply that this radioactive C14 is then incorporated into gas called carbon dioxide. So a very small amount of CO2, or carbon dioxide, uh, has radioactive C14 in it, which then drifts down through the strata, through the uh, the various layers in our, make, makes up the air, the surface above the Earth, uh, drifts down to ground level and is incorporated using photosynthesis into the plants. So the plants then have radioactive C14 in them. Um, and then, of course, we eat some plants, 
But animals also eat the plants, and of course we eat the animals and the plants. So, so both the plants and the animals and humans as well all have a small amount of C14 in them. Now, on the right-hand scale there, if you look, you can see the figure 16. So if you had uh, 16 grams of C14, which you wouldn't have because there's only a, we're only talking about tiny amounts, but if you came back after 5,730 years, only half of it would have decayed. In other words, it's not C14 anymore. It's decayed back to nitrogen. If you came back after another 5,730 years, you'll find there's only 4 grams of um, C14, and so on. And so the theory is that if you know how much C14 in is in a piece of material, you can date it. Now, the shroud was made from lac, uh, flax. The shroud of Turin is authentic and was manufactured at the time of Christ. And the linen in the shroud, manufactured around 33 AD, already had radioactive C14 in it because it's made from flax, which is plants, which has got radioactive C14 in it. Um, so the, um, the shroud from the time of Christ... Uh, had radioactive C14 in it. Now, this is very important. Carbon dating doesn't actually date anything. What happens is the, um, the people who interpret the results basically use the known, known rate of decay of C14, and using this known rate of decay, you can see in the British Museum, the various specialists have said that the shrouded Turin, based on carbon dating, is based 1260 to 1390. The AD 1260 to 1390 date was calculated by secular scientists who haven't taken into account the physics of the resurrection, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, this is very important to understand. It's not that complicated. According to carbon dating theory, if the shroud had very little radioactive C14 in it, the radioactive C14 thus must therefore have decayed and it must be dated 33 AD. So on the right, they have a very pale shroud, which indicates that um, there's very little radioactive C14 in it. The glass is empty, and that would be a 33 AD shroud. But what they actually found was, uh, on the right there, a very bright sh shroud, shall we say, indicating lots and lots of radioactivity. There's a glass half full to illust illustrate, we're talking about lots and lots of radioactivity in this shroud, and they th therefore they say that according to the laws of carbon dating, it must be medieval, and maybe, Le they haven't actually said, but a lot of people say that Leonardo da Vinci uh, created the shroud. So just to go through that once again, a very pale shroud, no, very little radioactivity, it's all decayed, an empty glass, it's the 33 AD shroud. A 1325 AD shroud, uh, would be uh, on the right there, lots of radioactivity, uh, lots of C14 present, therefore it must be medieval, therefore possibly Leonardo da Vinci or somebody else created it. I hope you can understand that. A pale shroud, 33 AD, very little radioactivity, lots of radioactivity, it's a medieval shroud, 1325. Now, Leonardo da Vinci couldn't have created the Shroud of Turin. He just couldn't, it's not possible. Now, Leonardo da Vinci was a supremely gifted Renaissance artist, designer, scientist, engineer, and thinker, and many people believe he created the Shroud of Turin. Barry Schwartz, the official Shroud of Turin photographer, has publicly stated that the Shroud of Turin could, could not be created by the cleverest scientists in the world today. In fact, I've said earlier, it would be easier for Leonardo da Vinci to have designed and launched the, the Hubble Space Telescope, which was actually launched in 1990. Now, NASA planned the work on the Hubble Space Telescope in 1970, and my point is this, the technology is now available for Leonardo da Vinci to create a Hubble Space Telescope. But the laser technology uh, is not available today in 2009 for, for Leonardo da Vinci or anybody else to create a Shroud of Turin. Because nobody's got those, that technology. So nobody can create a fake Shroud of Turin in 2009. So I want to now issue a challenge for all the Shroud of Turin sceptics, of which there are many out there, because most people think the Shroud of Turin is a fraud. Before you start, let me remind you, the, remind you of the challenges you face to create a fraudulent Shroud of Turin. First, you need to obtain a first century piece of precious Jewish linen in a specific weave, 14 inches, sorry, 14 feet 3 inches long and 3 feet 7 inches wide exactly. This must exactly match the identical linen from Masada, Israel, woven in a specific way on a special ancient loom. 
basically, this is unavailable, according to Metchild, Met, sorry, Metchild Fleury Lemberg, a worldwide authority on ancient textiles. This piece of linen is very specific and must contain pollen from Jerusalem and calcium aragonite from ancient Jerusalem. And then you need to obtain not one, but two different Roman leptons, coins, both minted by Pontius Pilate in AD 29. Now, there are only 13 known specimens in the entire world of all five of the Pontius Pilate coins, but you need two more minted in AD 29. I'm going to say you're going to find that quite difficult to find two more. Uh, then you've got to apply human blood type AB with a very high content of bilirubin, because that's what, uh, when victims are tortured, as happened during the crucifixion, there's a high bilirubin content in the blood. Now the special blood must now be applied to your fraudulent cloth in exactly the right places to collect, correctly demonstrate the scourging, the crown of thorns, the crucifixion nails, and the Roman lance. And you've got to apply the human blood uh, before you burn the image on the shroud. There's no image under the blood, so the blood must be applied first. And the blood that you apply must exactly match the identical blood on the Sidarium of Oviedo in Spain, which is kept in a closely guarded sealed wooden box. Now, we suggest you wait for three days and three nights, because that's what we have believed happened in the case of the original, but what you do is entirely up to you. But that's actually, all of that's very simple compared with the next part. Now you've got to scorch an image of a crucified man onto the linen using an unknown laser radiation technique in photonegative for the image and photopositive for the blood. The technology, as I keep saying, is currently unavailable in 2009. Your scorch marks must contain distance imaging three-dimensional properties which will convince scientists using NASA's VP8 image analyzing computer. Now the Shroud of Turin, as I rem uh, must remind you, is the only known image on Earth that contains these three-dimensional properties. Um, we'd actually love you to create another one. We'd love to see how you're going to do it. Now, when you created the second Shroud of Turin, please uh, uh, put C14 on it to your 2009 fraud, so it will be dated to 1325 by radiocarbon dating. But before you do that, let me warn you that nobody has ever managed to apply radioactive C14 to any material to actually predate it by 700 years before the material's actual date. Uh, now you've got to convince the whole world that the Sidarium of Oviedo in Spain, which contains identical blood type AB and identical blood marks to your fraud, is also a fraud just like yours. You've also got to convince the whole world that the Hungarian Prey Codex manuscript dated 1192, which shows the same herringbone weave and identical patterns of small poker burn holes found in your fraud, is also a fraud. Now, the Shroud of Turin is the single most studied artifact in human history, according to Chuck Missler. You've got a, you've got a very difficult test now. You've got to convince literally thousands and thousands of highly qualified scientists including many professors in their field, that your fraud possesses all of the properties of the Shroud of Turin. Uh, these will include photographic experts, nuclear physicists, botanists, archaeologists, historians, forensic pathologists, radiologists, carbon dating experts, textile specialists, and experts in ancient Jewish antiquities. Um, a whole list of them, we've covered some of them, but there are a whole lot more we haven't discussed. Uh, now we come to an even more difficult challenge for you, because, you see, Leonardo da Vinci is credited with doing two things. First of all, he created an image using technology which is not available now. In 2009, nobody can create a three-dimensional image like the Shroud. Um, and secondly, create an image which was analyzed by the VP8 image analyzing computer, which is technology which was only available 500 years after he died. So therefore, you've got to be able to see into the future to pass part two of the test. Part two of the test is to create an image using unavailable technology. That's your first part. And then see into the future and accurately predict the technology which will be available 500 years from now in the year 2509 to scientifically validate your image. Your image must be unique in the whole of the Earth in the year 2509, just like the Shroud is now. Now, here's a conclusion to any rational and unprejudiced scientist. The Shroud of Turin is unique, and the technology is not, not understood, and nor is it ever likely to be. 
The Shroud of Turin is from the time of Jesus with an image of a crucified man perfectly formed in photonegative with three-dimensional properties. Um, Dame Isabel Pixek, I mentioned before, she's also a particle physicist and explains the physics of the image on the shroud. She says that, the formation of the image on the sh that at the formation of the image on the shroud, there was an event horizon when the body of Jesus was suspended in space with zero gravity. She says that at the formation of the image on the shroud, there was no gravity, no entropy, no gravitational collapse, no time and no space. And she says that this conforms to no known laws of physics and is a true event horizon. Uh, now, Dr. August Setter has actually discovered how the image of the shroud was, of Turin was actually formed. It was formed by radiation. Now, Dr. August Asseta is a radiologist in California and founder of the Shroud Center of Southern California. And he did a very interesting experiment on, on, on himself. Remember, he's a radiologist. Um, and he said he believed that the image on the shroud was similar to an X-ray and that the image was caused by a blast of nuclear radiation. So he discovered, in our opinion, exactly how the image on the shroud was formed. And he's actually very humble about his amazing discovery. He was convinced of the authenticity of the shroud and he believed that the image on the shroud was caused by a burst of radioactivity. So he injected himself with radioactive material and produced an image with dimensionally encoded information. And then he put himself under the VPA image analyzing computer and produced on the right there a three-dimensional image of himself, similar but not as good as the shroud, without using any paint or pigment of any sort. You can read about his discovery on shroud.com. Now, just uh, for the scientists who are watching, this is what he actually did. He said, we have used a human model labeled with radioactive methylene diphosphonate to successfully reproduce some of the many shroud image characteristics such as borderless density shading, soft tissue and skeletal information, vertical alignment and non-contact imaging. This was achieved by capturing emitting, emitted radiation using a gamma camera and vertical collimator. Conclusion, some significant shroud image characteristics can be best explained using an emitting radiation model. No other human model we know of has approximated the shroud image this closely. So we now know that the image on the shroud was caused by a burst of nuclear radiation. And also the shroud has x-ray qualities. You can see what appears to be x-ray features of Jesus' hands on the left, and on the right, if you look very carefully, you can make out teeth because the shroud has on the left there x-ray properties and you can make out some teeth. So th there's also another image on the back of the shroud uh, corresponding to Jesus' face and so there are unknown x-ray properties of the shroud. Conclusion, the x-ray appearances on the shroud support Dr. Assetti's theory that the image was caused by radiation. Now we're going to try and we're not going to be able to do this, but I, I have a, a theory about how this came about. And to do this, we have to study the resurrected and glorified body of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. At the Transfiguration, which is in Matthew 17, it says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with Jesus. Well, at the transfiguration, um, Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. So, we're also told in Revelation chapter 1, that when uh, John saw J Jesus Christ in heaven, it says, And standing among them was one who looked like Jesus, who called himself the Son of Man. And this is what John says, and his face shone like the power of the sun in unclouded brilliance. Now, notice that Jesus' face is brighter than the sun at noon. So when Jesus Christ was resurrected, the light from his face and his body obviously shone through the shroud. And we believe that the radiation emitted at the resurrection caused the photonegative image complete with three-dimensional properties. And now we're going to look at light. Now, light is actually formed of photons moving in a waveform. We cover this in our creation uh, seminar. Um, but light from the sun in outer space actually includes visible light, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet rays, and infrared rays. Now we're going to try and work out possibly what may have happened at the transfiguration. 
Now, Einstein, Albert Einstein uh, produced the theory of relativity e equals mc squared, and there's a relationship between energy, mass, and the speed of light. Now, according to theoretical physics, if it were, if it were, if it were possible for atoms to move at the speed of light, the atoms would enter a dimension outside time and space, which the Bible describes as eternity, where God lives. Now, when at the Transfiguration, there was Moses and Elijah present. So we can assume that actually Jesus was then at the Transfiguration in eternity. Since Jesus was in eternity, the atoms of his body were moving at or beyond the speed of light, according to theoretical physics. So according to theoretical physics, as the atoms of Jesus' body accelerated the speed of light, Jesus actually entered eternity. Since Moses and Elijah were present, we can assume that Jesus Christ was really in eternity. Now, we don't know exactly what happened at the Transfiguration, but we do know that Jesus' body gave off intense light. So it's reasonable to assume that, the change occur that some change occurred in the atoms of Jesus' body. The speed of the atoms of Jesus' body greatly accelerated, giving off intense light and almost certainly radiation as well. Now, when Moses went up the mountain to see God, we're told that by, in the Bible that uh, Moses went up Mount Sinai to, to receive the Ten Commandments, but when he came down, we're told in Exodus 34, Moses didn't realize as he came back down the mountain with the tablets that his face glowed from being in the presence of God. Well, this was almost certainly a radiation phenomenon. So when Jesus was resurrected, the shroud was in intimate contact with the glorified body of Jesus Christ. And it probably shone with light and radiation in the same way as Moses' face. Now we know that the resurrection was a, a radioactive process because that's what Dr. S. Asseta discovered. The burst of radiation at the resurrection caused more radioactive C14 to be formed on the actual material of the shroud. And the additional radioactive C14 on the shroud has been proved by the carbon dating machines. The actual, um, the people who did the carbon dating of the shroud have done us a great favor because they've actually shown that there's additional radioactive C14 on the on a shroud, uh, which is unexpected. Um, it, as I told you before, there was a lot of C14 on the shroud. It's a radioactive shroud. Now, Remember that Mechthild Fleury Lemberg specifically discounts the invisible mending theory. She says that in her professional opinion, no additional cloth has been added to the authentic first century shroud. So after three days and three nights, Jesus' uncorrupted body was raised from the dead, leaving an image on the shroud of Turin. The resurrection added additional C14 to this first century shroud. Nobody was present, and we don't know exactly how the resurrection took place. But we do have a number of pointers from the Bible and also from nuclear physics. The Holy Spirit re-entered the dead body of Jesus with a tremendous burst of light and energy similar to the transfiguration. The radiation was sufficient to raise the dead body of Jesus back to life and also to clothe his body with light and to resurrect his dead but uncorrupted body. Remember, Jesus is God and is clothed, by, and is clothed in light. In Psalm 104, it says that God covers himself with light as with a garment. So Jesus' body was now raised to his glorified body. And remember, at the transfiguration, Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. So probably the shroud became as white as the light when Jesus was raised to his glorified body. In heaven, his face shone like the power of the sun in unclouded brilliance. Now, the shroud was in direct contact with the body of Jesus Christ, and the atoms of Jesus' body were now traveling at the speed of light because Jesus Christ was now in eternity. And at the resurrection, the linen of the shroud was subjected to a huge burst of light and radiation, which included visible light, ultraviolet light, infrared light, gamma rays, and X-rays, and the burst of light and radiation caused more radioactive C14, C14 to be formed. It may have been from nitrogen in the air or from the carbon in the chlorophyll of the, of the flax. The first century shroud now contained much more radioactive C14. The light, including X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet rays, as well as, a, as radiation of subatomic particles, in some way left a perfect imprint of Jesus' crucified body on the shroud. 
The image was in photo negative except for the blood which was in photo positive. The blood had already been there for three days and was in normal photo positive. The photo negative image was caused at the resurrection. The image on the shroud caused by the radiation has th unique three-dimensional properties which were only discovered in 1976 using the VP8 image analyzing NASA computer. The images of the coins over the eyes minted by Pontius Pilate dated the shroud to the years immediately after 29 AD. The x-rays released at the resurrection even left behind x-ray features on the shroud. The extra, the extra C14 proves that additional radiation was added to the original shroud dated 33 AD, which proves the resurrection. The excess C14 in the linen of the shroud was caused by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Shroud of Turin is actually a parable. It's a modern 21st century parable. You see, Jesus said to his disciples, he said the knowledge, this is in Luke chapter 8, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you. The Shroud of Turin is a secret. And he says the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, the believers. However, Jesus said this, but to others I speak in parables, so, so that those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. I think it's true of the shroud that people, they look at it and they don't see it, they hear about it and they don't understand it. Peter, it says in 2 Peter 3, in the last days scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. Most people scoff at the Shroud of Turin. You know, I speak about the Shroud of Turin a lot. And, you know, people scoff at the Shroud. They think it's a fraud. It's not a fraud. It's a modern scientific miracle. The Shroud of Turin is a modern scientific miracle. To Christians who understand the resurrection, the fact that the Shroud has lots of re radioactive C14 in it is fantastic, wonderful news because Jesus Christ left behind him undeniable scientific evidence of his resurrection. The Shroud of Turin proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's the garden tomb. It's empty. There's nobody there. There's the door. He's not here because he's risen. Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus Christ created the whole universe. Only God can do that. God the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead, creating the Shroud of Turin in the process. Only God can raise the dead. Only God can create the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin pro provides absolute scientific evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Here I presented to you absolute undeniable scientific evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is alive. Thank you for looking at this. I hope you found this interesting. God bless you for watching this. I hope this has helped you. Please, please study this and distribute it. Please use this information and let your friends know all about this important information. The Shroud of Turin is authentic and scientifically, scientifically proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you.